introduce the next speaker, who is Dr. Sarah Oliver, and she'll be talking about COVID-19 vaccines and vaccine hesitancy, lessons from the past and future, past and goals for the future. Uh, Dr. Oliver currently serves as the lead for the COVID-19 vaccines ACIP work group and a medical officer in the Division of Viral Diseases at the National Center for Immunizations and Respiratory Diseases. She is board certified in pediatrics and pediatric infectious disease and has a master's of science in public health. Uh, she's been working on the COVID-19 pandemic since January of 2020 and has uh, officially transitioned to work on COVID-19 vaccine policy full-time uh, within the Division of Viral Diseases at the CDC. So we're really looking forward to uh, hearing your talk, uh, Dr. Oliver, and I will hand over the podium to you. Thanks so much. I'm uh, happy to be here. So um, I think people are, are well aware of this, um, but just wanted to um, just wanted to make sure that I'm in bed. Um, uh, this is the updated epi curve. You can see that um, we've had uh, 82 um, to 83 million cases that have been reported to CDC so far. If you look at uh, the most recent epi curve, we may be kind of peaking at this most recent um, uh surge where uh, the seven day average is, is going down for the last week or so. So we'll just need to watch that really closely uh, and see how that happens uh, over time. Um, then as we highlight uh, to do uh, specifically to look at children, these are the COVID weekly cases uh, among children and adolescents. You can see we've had over 12 million cases among children through 17 years of age. Um, and uh, the cases among children were the highest in the Omicron surge uh, than they had been at any point uh, in the pandemic. And we know that not every case gets counted and reported to CDC. Sometimes um, children aren't uh, tested or they were asymptomatic. And so we also monitor seroprevalence or looking at antibody levels. Uh, and you can see that as we went through this Omicron surge, the seroprevalence uh, really dramatically increased. Uh, and the pediatric kind of a, across the pandemic, the pediatric populations uh, are who has had the, the highest groups where children five through 11 at this most recent study in February, uh, just 77% of those children had evidence of prior infection. Then um, I'm highlighting this is data from, from five through 11 because that's what we just presented and discussed at uh, the most recent ACIP um, meeting. Those slides are all online, so I won't go through these in detail, but just highlighting that if we looked at this population in the Omicron surge, we saw that nearly all of the hospitalized children were unvaccinated, and a third of the hospitalized children had no underlying medical conditions. Uh, so it's not, um, it, there's a narrative that it's only children who have underlying medical conditions who get sick with COVID, um, and that's really not what we saw uh, as we go through. So we've highlighted or have shown that children um, can get sick uh, with COVID-19 and can have severe disease. But I just highlighted in a few slides here, we also know that vaccines work uh, for children in this age group. So this is our uh, VE against hospitalization for one of the platforms that we monitor again, I uh, showed more in detail at the most recent ACIP meeting, uh, but we have high vaccine efficacy in this or effectiveness in this population. This is another um, platform that looks at hospitalization, uh, again, with, with high VE that we've seen. And then uh, we've even be, been able to show uh, that vaccination can prevent uh, MISC, which we've heard um, about uh, earlier today. However, in spite of knowing that vaccines work, we're just not seeing the uptake, especially in that 5 through 11 population, uh, as we uh, would potentially anticipate. So this shows that uh, only around a third of kids have even begun uh, a series uh, and less than 30% are fully vaccinated. So just kind of um, pulling that side together, again, kind of outlining this, um, what we know about vaccines. We know children and adolescents are at risk of severe illness. We know receipt of the primary series protects, especially against uh, severe disease. However, uptake is low, especially in that five through 11 population. So what are some things we know about why that would be? 
Um, this was a uh, survey around parental attitudes towards COVID vaccines. Um, and some of the data show that, that the children's healthcare provider is a reliable and trustworthy source. This is a, a consistent finding that we get in all of our surveys that parents uh, really turn to their healthcare provider. However, we know that parents are worried about uh, possible serious or rare side effects. Um, then we've also heard that either the vaccine won't work or that children don't need it, which is why I tried to show at the beginning that we do know that children uh, can get severe disease from COVID. Then we know this is looking at five through 11 and 12 to 17. Um, we again see this kind of drop off with five through 11 um, where uh, a lower proportion are vaccinated or say that they're likely to get the vaccine. Um, and we do know that um, there's a smaller proportion at every age group that's uh, ready to get it right away. Then we have kind of the wait and see uh, population, especially for parents where, where they're not against it ever, but they want to wait uh, and see what data look like and what the experience is in the first several months. And then there's a, a solid potentially third of the population that says absolutely not. And this is looking at a, um, some people may be familiar with the NIS National Immunization Survey. So doing additional studies specifically looking at COVID. Again, this was focused on five through 11 for our most recent ACIP discussion, but we see similar patterns across all age groups. We know, as you can see on the left, um, that uh, uptake um, and intent to get vaccinated varies by race and ethnicity. Um, on the right, you can see that it varies by um, poverty level, as well as I really want to hone in on this kind of middle of the right, where we know that it drastically changes uh, when you focus in on the rural population. This was an MMWR that was put out that showed across the U.S. COVID vaccination coverage was lower in rural counties than in urban counties. And we're seeing that disparity actually increase while in many instances we've been able to decrease disparities. Uh, this, is, this is unfortunately a disparity that over time has just continued to grow. Um, and when we look, the largest gap is actually uh, in the pediatric populations. And when um, they drilled into trying to figure out why uh, parents were more than twice as likely to state uh, that their child would definitely not get a vaccine. Again, we know that um, parents say that, that getting information from their healthcare provider as their most trusted source. However, really concerningly, um, nearly 40% of rural parents reported that their child's pediatrician or any healthcare provider, so it wasn't necessarily just the pediatrician, did not recommend a COVID vaccine, compared with only 8% of parents in urban communities. So again, we know that vaccine recommendations from a healthcare provider are strong predictors of COVID vaccine. So again, parents, when we try to look at um, what we know about vaccine hesitancy from parents, uh, about half of parents are worried about rare or serious side effects, um, but there are parents who are worried about COVID, worried about new variants. Then we know that there, um, as we move to new age groups, we can kind of expect to see this as we move to that under five population as well, that there's a, a proportion of the population that's very eager right away, but then uh, there's kind of a larger proportion that's more the wait and see. Um, but over time, uh, many of the surveys show that that the majority of parents do intend to vaccinate their children. So we just need to continue to reassure them about the safety uh, and effectiveness of these vaccines. And again, the importance of a strong healthcare provider recommendation. So what do we know about vaccine confidence in general uh, and for COVID vaccines specifically? Again, vaccine confidence is built on trust. Um, the trust that they have in the vaccines, in the providers who administer vaccines, and in the process and policies that lead to vaccine development. This last point is critically important to me uh, as um, what we do with ACIP. Um, and this is why all of our discussions for vaccine policy are held in, a, in an open and public forum. Um, and so uh, encourage people to listen um, you know, to any of those meetings and really kind of watch the process play out. CDC has a uh, vaccinate with confidence strategy um, to look at ways to increase confidence. Then there's a, a pediatric addition. Uh, this existed prior to the pandemic to um, uh, combat vaccine hesitancy just in general. And then it's been tailored a little bit more uh, for COVID vaccines as, as we've been in the pandemic. But looking at, again, this component of building trust, 
sharing clear, complete, and accurate messages about COVID vaccines for parents and caregivers, and empowering healthcare personnel. Again, we continue to know that this, um, uh, this is so important um, that parents turn to their healthcare provider uh, for information. And so if we've empowered the healthcare personnel to make sure that they can have effective conversations, know how to answer the questions when they get asked, um, that that can really uh, be one of the things that makes the biggest difference uh, when we think through uh, parental intent to disease vaccines. The engaging families, communities, and schools in a two-way communication uh, as well. Looking at kind of this ladder to build vaccines, I think it's, it's critically important that we make sure that vaccines are accessible so that they're easy to get, that they're beneficial, and again, that we're communicating that they are beneficial, uh, knowing that the, the benefits outweigh um, uh, any perceived or real side effects of vaccination, then making sure they're convenient, that they're desirable, that they're normative, um, and this can be really important as we think through some of that wait and see um, population that some of those parents just want to hear that other parents are doing this. Um, and so uh, encouraging people to um, you know, post on social media that they got their children vaccinated, uh, that um, tell their friends that, you know, that as a parent, they were felt comfortable getting their children vaccinated uh, and that it's necessary. Um, you know, indispensable for accessing things they want to get back to doing that um, potentially getting to go to camp or, or getting to do other things um, uh, can be more feasible uh, or people can do have more comfort when they're vaccinated. And then these are some specific demand, I mean, some specific uh, ways building on that <clears throat> for um, kind of some real world examples. I won't go through all of this, but happy to share the slides. Um, that making, making the vaccines convenient. So um, uh, having evening and weekend vaccine clinics, that's something that uh, as a working mom, I have had to take advantage of uh, to get my children vaccinated. Uh, is there a way to have childcare, paid time off so, um, so parents can get their children to a clinic? Making sure they're beneficial, again, sharing data from recent vaccine studies. We've tried to do this at all ECIP meetings and then turn that around into, um, uh, you know, social media posts, or, or what does that benefit risk balance look like for these vaccines? Uh, and this shows that um, in, you know, Northern Michigan, they had a, a contest where they um, uh, had the kids draw art uh, that would encourage others to get a COVID vaccine. Again, making it accessible um, uh, and, and an example here. Then making it necessary. Again, CDC does not um, uh, have anything to do with mandates required for school, required for extracurricular activities. All of that is handled on a, a state or county level. Um, but again, a real world example is that uh, in Illinois, they required you know, places to, um, to look at proof of vaccination. Um, and we do know that in surveys, there have been individuals and parents who've said, I would only do it if it was required for my kid to go to school. So we know that there is a, a subset of the population um, that would only do it if it was required. Then again, to make it normative. Um, so uh, having kind of those social media posts, um, uh, having people see that, you know, other parents feel comfortable with this um, and then making it desirable. I think there's there's been a lot of, of interesting things that people have done, um, uh, you know, uh, free, free, you know, uh, alcohol at bars, free admission to events. Um, uh, so I think people have been really creative uh, throughout the pandemic of that. And we know that the willingness to accept a vaccine falls on a continuum. And this actually isn't uh, COVID specific, this slide, uh, existed and, and has been a, a part of these talks um, for, a, for a while, um, but we just know that, that it's a conversation we're having a lot more now as we go into COVID. There are a handful of individuals who say, I don't care what you say to me, you know, I'm not going to ever get a COVID vaccine, I don't trust anything. Um, but there, there is a substantial amount of the population that's in this kind of that middle um, that says they have questions. Uh, they may want uh, a wait and see, they may want more information but that they really can, um, can be moved uh, to go from kind of the, the left side of this figure to the right side. Um, and so I think that's, um, that's really where we need to focus our, um, our attention. How can we better address 
Um, what type of questions do people have? How can we address these questions? And how can we empower uh, other people to answer them as well? Some strategies. Um, these are, are um, again, slides that CDC has put together and, and has, um, they can do rapid vaccine uh, consults. So uh, there's an uh, email address at the end of the talk. So they're happy to kind of engage uh, and walk through, but overall strategies, partnering with local health departments, uh, health systems or pharmacies to host vaccination clinics, providing a safe space for parents to ask questions, recruit vaccine champions from, from the community and offer frequent and culturally appropriate communications about COVID vaccines. This is, um, I think, something that, that we've really um, learned and, and has been uh, exemplified throughout the COVID and, uh, pandemic as we, especially as we've thought about vaccines, is people want information um, from people who look and sound like them. Um, so I can go on, you know, as somebody uh, in CD, you know, at CDC in uniform, I can answer questions, I can have webinars, um, and I am more than happy to do that. But sometimes the best thing we can do is just empower uh, people within uh, individual communities to have the information so they can communicate. Um, because I, making sure that that people within communities who can have these kind of uh, you know culturally appropriate uh, in communication um, and that the vaccine information can be communicated again from people who, who look and sound uh, like that parent like that child. But again, tailoring that vaccine education to community needs. Um, emphasizing the benefits of vaccination that resonate with parents in the communities. And this may, this will this very obviously differ, I think, um, by types of, um, of community. So, so if you're in a very vaccine hesitant community, the types of communication may be very different uh, than a, a vaccine community um, that, that has a whole, I mean, that a, a community that has a lot of vaccine uptake. Again, making sure that plain language is being used um, and in preferred language. So um, <clears throat> CDC has tried to make sure that we have a multitude of languages with our uh, materials available and have been partnering with uh, a lot of communities uh, to, to learn which languages it would be desirable to have additional information in. And then making information in a, in a different preferred format. So um, again, print information, uh, video, web content, et cetera. And then again, this trusted messenger engagement. I think there's, uh, we really can't emphasize this enough that, um, you know, sometimes again, there, there's people in the community that will not trust CDC just because of who we are. Um, and so while we do everything we can to get the message out ourselves, uh, we also are trying to empower uh, trusted messengers within the communities as well um, to, uh, so, so they can kind of effectively deliver these messages and strategies. Then addressing mis misinformation on social media. I know this was discussed, Dr. Hotez, um, brought some, some really interesting, it was really interesting to hear his talk. Um, uh, but there's, there's a variety of ways, um, to do that. Working with communication staff, this is, you know, in a school or in a school system to take questions on social media, sharing factual information. Um, and debunking false claims or myths that can spread online. Then there's a variety of shareable content um, that is uh, at CDC. So uh, again, I'm happy to share these slides so these links are accessible. So then what have we learned uh, through COVID-19? <laughs> I liked this one, be aware of the social media iceberg, that sometimes what we see on social media uh, is really only the tip of the iceberg, but there's a lot more um, communication uh, that's happening out there that, uh, that may not be uh, as visible to everyone uh, that we could see on social media. And social media platforms are designed to spread outrage. Um, we've seen this a lot with COVID vaccines where they will pick um, a, you know, an unfortunate uh, incident that happened that has absolutely nothing to do with COVID vaccines, but then they'll spread it, tag it to vaccines uh, and it'll it'll spread like wildfire um, because it's it's kind of designed to to create this outrage. And we know that misinformation affects vulnerable populations uniquely. You're in a low trust environment uh, with limited sources of credible information. We know that misinformation can can be more easily amplified, so this can be an important place uh, to target. 
Uh, we know that they're spreading, these disinformation campaigns are spreading globally. Um, but it's difficult to link uh, online information to offline behavior. Um, and then I just this last one that debunking misinformation is actually really difficult because sometimes it, it feeds a narrative um, and we find ourselves in kind of a catch-22 um, that uh, if we clarify it, sometimes we're, we're just giving more validation to the fact that it's a question, but we do try to get as much factual information out as possible. Um, then again, CDC has conducted resources and they're actually, uh, the link at the bottom are these pediatric reports. So if, if knowing uh, what the surveys have shown would be helpful, there is a link there. Um, not surprising that it's apprehension about safety, uh, effectiveness, and perceived side effects. Um, then the remainder of my slides are really just support and resources because uh, it's you guys, it's people on the front lines uh, that are really going to have the biggest impact. So we just want to make sure that you guys are empowered uh, as much as possible. Um, so I've got online resources, vaccination strategies, uh, again, the vaccination communication resources, uh, and then this is the uh, email website that, I mean, the, the email address for confidence consults, if that would be helpful for anybody uh, struggling with this kind of in their own community. Um, and with that, I'm finished. Thanks so much.